I'd like to introduce our uh, keynote speaker, David Axelrod. David is a veteran of American politics and journalism and the former chief strategist and senior advisor to President Barack Obama. He currently serves as director of the University of Chicago's nonpartisan Institute of Politics, a senior political commentator on CNN, and host of The Axe Files, a top-rated podcast jointly produced by CNN and his institute. David is a former political writer for the Chicago Tribune and later a media strategist for over 150 state, local, and national political campaigns. And he is the author of a New York Times best-selling memoir, Believer, My 40 Years in Politics. Please welcome David Axelrod. Thanks, Scott. Good to be here. Welcome to Chicago. For those of you from out of town, I know you heard from the mayor this morning, my friend the mayor, who probably had that incredible lightness that comes from a guy who just gave his final budget address yesterday to the city council. Um, I also, I, is Bill Shazlowski Shaz still here? Well, here he is. Yeah. Nobody ever wants to follow him on a speaker's platform. <laughs> but I, I will say that uh, this uh, movement is deeply blessed to have, to have Bill. Anyone who's been on the receiving end of one of his emails uh, knows what a powerful advocate he can be. So, uh, and I think you got a sense of it here. Um, I don't have slides. Um, I don't have... Uh, I don't have clips to play for you. Um, all I have is a story, and it's the story of my family and our experience and our daughter, uh, Lauren, who lives here, uh, and uh, for whom uh, this place has meant everything. Um, my daughter uh, was born in 1981, and she was the most, everybody says this, but in my case, in our case, my. My wife Susan's back there, she can attest to it. She was the most beautiful baby who was ever born. <laughs> and she was perfect in every way. And she, she was our first child. We were young parents and everything was grand. And then seven months in, um, Susan found her blue and limp in her crib, thought she had passed away uh, and um, rushed her to the hospital and uh, when I arrived there, we both witnessed our first grand mal seizure, seeing our little seven-month-old child uh, gripped by this violent, violent convulsion. And we were told that it would probably pass in a couple of days that was related to a cold that she had, maybe a fever. T and uh, a month later, we were released from the hospital, and she was still having 10 seizures a day. Uh, and uh, now she was heavily medicated uh, and they had no answers for us and for the next 18 years she had uncontrolled seizures but what's relevant here is that those seizures did terrible damage to her developing brain as did these medications that uh, kept pi being piled on to try uh, and control them and so um, we saw the developmental effects of that very early. Um, and she went through school uh, and uh, at first it was fine. We were desperately interested in having her included, mainstreamed. We thought that was important. We didn't want her to be uh, uh, pushed off to the side. Um, but it, we, it was an interesting lesson for us. We actually moved uh, to go to a school district that uh, practiced inclusion in a very uh, robust way. And, but as Lauren got older, uh, the painful realization was that um, she was growing at a different rate than uh, her classmates. And she, 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 she desperately wanted to be uh, included, she wanted friends. 
but uh, as the interests of the, uh, particularly the girls, but girls and boys uh, started changing, uh, you know, she was left behind emotionally uh, and, and intellectually, she was growing at a, at a, at a different clip. Uh, by the time she got to high school, she was seeking out her own peer group uh, with whom she could relate and with whom she could have, um, have a life. And, uh, you know, but we were faced with a problem of what, to do, what she could do outside of school. Um, and we worked very hard to find social situations for her and programs for her. They were sporadic, uh, but they were there. And then uh, when Lauren was uh, a, a teenager, um, Susan was diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, and we suddenly, for the first time in our lives, were confronted with our own mortality and the reality that we're not gonna be here forever. And what's gonna happen to Lauren when she turns, you know, 45 years old or 50 years old and suddenly her parents aren't there anymore? What's gonna happen if we are uh, uh, enfeebled by illness and we can't take care of her? Uh, and this became a consuming, uh, uh, fear for us and concern for us, and we started searching around for alternatives uh, that that might address this. One of the things that we considered was um, actually purchasing a home and giving it to a program in our community, a group home, and turning it into a group home. But then we began confronting the uh, questions about how that would be overseen and 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 uh, how we could keep the quality of care up and, w and, and w how, uh, uh, how she would function in a uh, isolated situation like that uh, because she needed a lot of structure in her life. Uh, and then we were introduced to Misericordia and we started visiting and we saw uh, what was happening here and um, it became very clear very quickly that for our, our daughter who needed socialization, who, who needed constant activity, that um, this might be a wonderful place. And she started coming here um, to a day program and uh, was really stimulated by it. And, uh, and we were lucky enough to, she was lucky enough to get a place here uh, and at first in the village over here, and now she lives in Shannon Apartments uh, in, with two other uh, women and in a place that feels more like a dormitory, a college dormitory uh, than anything else, where there's constant companionship and activity. Uh, her days are filled uh, with activities. She works off campus uh, with a group of, uh, of men and women uh, from Misericordia residents who work at Loyola University, working, doing, uh, cleaning classrooms and doing other things, um, which has been a broadening experience for her and one that she uh, relishes. Uh, she, uh, and, and understand, I should say parenthetically, 20 years ago, she was still having these seizures and we had no conception of what might happen in the future. We didn't even know if she'd be alive today or what kind of shape she would be in. We, we couldn't imagine the life that she's leading now. Uh, and she has become much more independent. She goes with some of her friends to the Target uh, in the neighborhood. She goes uh, to restaurants in the neighborhood. Uh, she has developed an independence that we frankly never thought possible. And, um, and she's done it uh, uh, in no small measure because of the uh, extraordinary people who work here and uh, who provide the kind of guidance and care and um, oversight that one w hopes for for their children. So 
in short, uh, Misericordia has given our daughter life, a life she never would have had uh, otherwise. It is, the, it is the perfect choice for her. And, um, and, and needless to say, and everybody here understands this when I say it, it's also changed our lives uh, because um, we have that peace of mind that comes with knowing that she, she's flourishing and that we're not in the position of having to try and find uh, something hour to hour for her to do that would fulfill her need for companionship and activity. Uh, I can't really imagine where she'd be today uh, if not for this uh, wonderful place. So I'm not just here today because uh, Sister Rosemary told me I had to be. <laughs> Though that alone would be reason enough. Uh, I'm here today because I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity for my child and for the gift that she's been given. And I want every uh, person for whom this kind of setting is, is the right kind of setting, for this, this kind of life is the right kind of life, to have that choice. You know, Bill is a fierce advocate, and when he speaks about the people on the other side of this debate, uh, he speaks with the fierceness of an advocate. I want to say a word about them. The fact is that uh, there were large institutions to which people with developmental disabilities were sent and warehoused and neglected and abused. There were. And, um, and there was, and I applaud those people who stood up uh, for those who couldn't speak for themselves to advocate for their civil rights and to advocate for their care. I, and, uh, but somewhere along the line, uh, this has become a dogma that size has become a fetish. Uh, and we've seen uh, this uh, turn into this uh, really perverse situation where uh, our children, our loved ones are told there's only one choice and we're going to tell you what it is. And let me also add that um, there, is no, uh, there is no size uh, limit to uh, abuse, to neglect. Uh, we've seen many instances of uh, of, of people who were abused and neglected in, in small settings, in group homes. Uh, we need to be as vigilant about that as we were about and continue to be about uh, the neglect and abuse of people in larger settings. <laughs> but these, these, these activists on the uh, other side of this debate on the other side of the struggle, uh, understood something, which is that if you build a movement, you can pressure. Uh, uh, Bill talks rightly about, about the bureaucracy, but the fact is that um, politicians um, react to pressure. And uh, the first instinct of, you know, I, I have, I've spent my life writing about politics I've spent, and in politics, okay? So I have great reverence for Pol politics as a means of um, s grabbing the wheel of history and turning it in the right direction. I, I believe in this. I believe deeply in, in, uh, in democracy and what it, what it offers us. Um, but <laughs> there so it's good to hear fans of democracy. Um, but it is also true that, uh, that for most politicians, uh, no matter how well-intentioned they are, uh, getting reelected is principle number one. Uh, it, it's the rare politician who's willing to risk their, to risk their tenure uh, for a principle, no matter how strongly they feel a, about it. I, I always say there's a reason why that book profiles in courage was such a slim volume. So if, if you're going to uh, 
bring about change in a democracy, then you have to be able to bring pressure on people in elective office to make them understand that uh, for us, this is a voting issue. For us, this is a principle uh, that will determine our evaluation of, of them. And that for us, this is a civil rights issue uh, and an issue uh, about how people in our society uh, who have vulnerabilities are going to be treated. Are they gonna be afforded the same right to choose how they will live as someone who doesn't have uh, disabilities. And that's really all we're asking. Bill talked about words like segregation uh, that have been invoked and images that have been invoked uh, to uh, describe uh, uh, larger settings. I think choice is a very powerful word. I think it's endemic. Uh, choice is something that uh, we value in our society, that we value uh, in our democracy, and every citizen should have it, even vulnerable citizens. And so we, we have to launch our own movement. We have to uh, launch our own movement for the rights of people with disabilities. And I quite agree with Bill. We can't surrender that turf. We are on, we are on solid ground. We are on, and we can each give testimony to why this is important. Uh, and, you know, I forgot to mention earlier, and I, want, I don't know, Sister, if you uh, have spoken yet. Have you? You did. I, well, I hope you shared the story of how Misericordia began. Uh, but if you, if you did, uh, I'm going to repeat it anyway. So. <laughs> and I apologize for missing your remarks. Uh, but uh, we are not inured. We are not insensitive to the, note, to the idea that... Um, there were these places, and I know you responded earlier, where people were, uh, where people were warehoused and forgotten and neglected and abused. And the fact that we're here today is in part because Sister was asked uh, by the archdiocese to uh, look after babies with severe disabilities until they were eligible. And correct me if I'm wrong. I know you won't hesitate to correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, but, but. Uh, and then turn them over to the state when they, turn, where they, when they were eligible, I think at the age of six, is that right? And uh, she took the first child over, she looked at the facility, and she said, no, we're not doing this. And she went back to the archdiocese and said, these, these children deserve better, and we can do better. And she told them that she asked for this property, is that right? Am I telling the story correctly? All right, good enough. I'm, uh, I'm in politics, close is good enough. Um, and, um, and that's how Misericordia was born. It was a recognition that we had to do better uh, for our most vulnerable people, and we have. And I know you, if you haven't taken a tour of, of Misericordia yet, uh, you, know, you will see for yourselves what a remarkable place it is, and uh, how affirming, and how supportive, and how extraordinary it is. And I know all of you have, uh, have examples in your own states uh, of, uh, of similar programs that are going on, similar pl uh, uh, places where uh, our uh, most vulnerable loved ones can thrive. Um, we need to invoke these examples. And um, so my fundamental message to you, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take questions in a second, but I'm here principally uh, because um, I believe so deeply we need this movement. I'm heartened to see so many people from so many places represented here. We need to expand that circle, these concentric circles, uh, larger and larger. Uh, we need to... Uh, we need to recruit uh, people who, like-minded people, to make their voices heard. We need uh, our policymakers to understand this is a voting issue for us. This is a, in our, uh, in our minds, a, a civil rights issue for the people we love and for others, uh, and that we're willing to fight for it. Um, 
and, and we need to bring our stories uh, to bear. So I really thank you for being here. I hope that I'll be invited back in future years and that even uh, the Jean Marie Ryan Center uh, will not be big enough to hold uh, all of the delegates to these meetings. And, um, and I am confident that what is beginning here will become a national movement and will make a difference. And uh, I, I can only tell you that I am, uh, I am committed to raising my voice uh, along with yours to see that that happens. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. If you have any questions, you may just want to eat lunch. <laughs> There's one over here, yeah. Yeah, sure, I understand. Have co-opted that term. Oh, thank you. Have co-opted that term from us because they say that this is their civil rights issue, that their civil rights are being violated, that it's their civil right to live in the community and that all people with disabilities should live in their community as a right. civil rights issue. How do we reclaim that It title? is their civil right to live in but the community. How do we get, I mean, but one that, of the things is we should, I'm sorry, I'm that's interrupting okay. I'm you. Sorry, because, you got me all riled up. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a little riled up too. Um, but how do we reclaim that and so that we can say that, no, the civil rights are actually providing choice for everybody, or is it? Yeah, well, I mean, the, you know, the thing is that I think we have the high ground because our argument isn't that people shouldn't have the choice to live in the community uh, uh, if that is what is best for them and that's what they and their families decide is best for them. Uh, what we're saying is that there should be a multiplicity of choices that you shouldn't be limited to one and, and no, uh, no government, no bureaucracy uh, should dictate where you have to live simply because you have uh, disabilities. Uh, that, is not, that is not right and that is the civil rights issue. We are not the ones who are saying it's one size fits all. We are not the ones who are saying we will tell you how and where uh, you're going to live. And um, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, one of the important things uh, Bill said is to stand tall on this. We, we are on the right side of the civil rights debate and we ought to fully engage it. And uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's the answer. I, you know, one of the great things about Misericordia is that there, there, there are so many different uh, living arrangements here uh, from uh, the, the townhouses that my daughter lived in to the apartment she's living in now to group homes in the community and much more involved places for people whose uh, disabilities are, are, are more profound and now nursing homes uh, here. So um, the whole range of choices is reflected right here in Misericordia, but the whole range of choices should be available everywhere and, uh, and, and let me just say one other word about this, because I've, I've tangled with some of these folks on the other side, as you refer to them, uh, uh, who, you know, who, I mean, have the righteousness of people who believe deeply in what they're, uh, what they're doing. And what I've told them is the real battle is over, should be over making sure that we have adequate resources so that there are a range of choices for people, we expend we, we expend so much energy fighting each other over something we shouldn't be fighting about, when we should be joining arms and directing our full energies to making sure that our most vulnerable citizens have these options. Uh, what is the waiting list here, sister? Yeah, hundreds of people are waiting uh, for the chance. To, to live here, uh, and, and that's a, you know, a small microcosm of the larger problem. Every state here, I think, will, can speak to the waiting list that people have uh, for any kind of living uh, arrangement. So we've got, such, we've got a much bigger fight to fight, and it's one that should unite the, the entire disabilities community. Uh, so we need to get past 
this fight, which, uh, uh, which doesn't make sense. There was someone else who... I, I have a question <clears throat> over here. Where, oh, I can there stand you are, up. There you are, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, so last summer I was at a congressional briefing for a bill that was introduced, and the bill, the purpose of the bill was to try to expand employment opportunities for people because when some regulations were written for the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, they were overly restrictive. They prohibited some placements in ability one uh, jobs and in state use jobs. Those are good jobs, they're good paying jobs, uh, and the notion is that somebody believes that they're not integrated without having made an individual decision on each job as to whether or not it's in a, a proper setting. So in wheels, uh, adapt protesters shouting at the top of their voices, disrupting this briefing that was meant to share information about this bill. And you know, I just want to uh, comment on that. And not only that, but when we were asked to leave the room while these people were being um, arrested, they threw the food that was provided for people with disabilities and others who attended the briefing all over the room. And I just think that's unacceptable in a society, in a democracy, to have people come in and not permit the other side their free speech that is their right. Yeah, well, I have no rebuttal to that. I, I agree with that completely. But there is a, let me repurpose your question. Um, you know, this issue of employment is another area where um, good intentions have run amok. Uh, because um, this job that my, my, my daughter has is, has, I think it's been one of the defining events uh, for her. Um, but, um, you know, on the one hand, if she were to earn too much, she would disqualify herself for Medicaid. Um, uh, you know, on, on the other hand, you have adv advocates uh, for people with disabilities arguing that um, everyone who has a job must make the minimum wage. And there are, th this has morphed into a larger debate about whether these people are taking jobs that other people would have had and is, is, are they being exploited. I mean, these are, this is a worthy discussion and we ought to be sensitive to it. Uh, but the reality, in the real world, what's happening is that, um, uh, you know, my, child and other children, uh, and by the way, this extends to people who are working in, in workshops here and, the, and peace work comes in. Um, it, is, it is a broadening and important experience uh, for them, and uh, we ought to be expansive in how we think about this and make sure that there is an allowance for uh, those kinds of opportunities and not in, you know, the road to, uh, to hell is paved with good intentions, not uh, by r walking down that road, close off opportunities uh, for them. This is another one of those debates that I think we need to have. So uh, I have a question if you have an, uh, any suggestions for addressing the Department yes. of Justice uh, misportrayal uh, for several years now on their website, they'll put integration for everyone and they'll have a document that uses the word isolation, say for example, yeah. sheltered workshops for 40, you know, 40 times in, one, in a one page document. Do you have any suggestions on how we might uh, address the uh, discriminatory language on the Department of Justice website, which has existed for several years? Yeah. Um. I feel moved to say, I think Bill would say it uh, for me if I didn't, that um, I, I had my own frustrations with this in my own administration. Um, beca again, you know, it's, uh, it, it is a, a one-sided view of, uh, of, of what civil rights and uh, the rights of, you know, we, we ought to be vigilant about exploitative situations and unfair situations wherever we find them. But we, we can't allow, you know, we could compile on this screen a um, compendium of horrendous stories and photos of abuses in group homes. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't, I, I would not propose that we shouldn't have them. 
I would propose that we should make sure that they're properly staffed and overseen. Uh, so um, we need to be as uh, we need to be as aggressive about pushing out our story and making this point uh, as the advocates on the other side are. And we've got to do it, I think, legislator by legislator, uh, agency by agency. Um, but these are, as, as Bill pointed out, these are stubborn things. Once the bureaucracy is imbued with these, this sort of conventional thinking, it's hard to blast it out. So, I mean, I just think we have to kind of be as aggressive as they are in pushing back in making this point. I think one of the mm -hmm. virtues of this group is the ability to do that and mobilize others to do that. Uh, and, you know, I'm not suggesting that we go into meetings and uh, disrupt them and throw food around. Um, but I think we should raise our voices and be very, very emphatic about it. Every single person here uh, should should uh, write the Justice Department and their congressman or uh, representative in Congress and senator to, to, to raise this point. And this should be a coordinated effort. So, uh, but, I, uh, but I, I recognize the problem and uh, it's a stubborn uh, artifact of a debate run amok. Um, I'm from Wilmington, Delaware, and I'm the mother of a 46-year-old man with an intellectual disability who lives in a group home now for over 20 years. Um, so I've been also doing this for a very long time, yes. and uh, I've been building group homes in Delaware for over 30 years. And I'm finding one of the biggest issues we have now with the other side, as we call them, is their ability now to have taken over all of these big agencies, and one of the most disconcerting groups that now we are also fighting against is the ACLU. And we have these uh, paid advocates and self-advocates who are now a part of the ACLU who won't talk to us. And I think the problem we have is they're not going to talk to me, but we need people like you who do have name recognition to help us get to these people so yeah. that we can have equal time. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I'm happy to work on uh, with, with, with uh, the, the team here uh, a, uh, uh, an effort to have such meetings and discussions. What's disconcerting to me is that you stand here and you say you, you, you run group homes, and that should give you a certain uh, that should give you a certain credibility in this discussion. Uh, and the fact that it doesn't, I think, is, is deeply disturbing. But we should go to the, the ACLU, uh, and we should go with uh, both our positive stories. And um, now they may just say, well, you're right, there are bad group homes, and we're against those too. Um, but, I mean, the fundamental point is size is not a predictor of quality. Size is not a predictor of quality. And, and nor, is, nor is one size fits all um, attuned to the reality of people with disabilities and their, who have differences in terms of their personalities and their needs, uh, just as people who don't have disabilities have. Some people live in apartments. Some people live, prefer to live in isolated rural areas. Uh, some people, you know, would, you know, you know, that, I mean, that's the way human beings are. I mean, my argument is why are we treating people with intellectual disabilities less than we would any other human being? So, um, so I, I'm happy to, I take your suggestion, and I'm happy to work with, with you on it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I already, I, I already copped to being a lover of democracy. Democracy isn't uh, ejecting people who have a different point of view than you. 
and so, you know, look, we've got, I don't want to minimize uh, the battle or the, the, uh, or the hill that needs to be climbed here, but the hill, as I look out at this room, s looks slightly less daunting than it did a few years ago. And we've just got to, we've got to build our numbers, act in an organized fashion, put pressure where pressure needs to be put, both locally and nationally, uh, and make sure that we begin to shift the debate and make sure that choice is as powerful a word in the debate as uh, segregation and some of the caricatures that have been used uh, against us. So one last question. One I'll make it quick. Um, yeah, I'm, thank you for being here. Yeah. I'm also a parent. My son's 15, and so many years ago, I start, started a nonprofit in my local community to help create programs and services for our special needs community. I worked extensively with our state rep and senator, and anytime I meet with them, they're very supportive, and we're going to be there. We're going to help you. And when it comes time to voting, they vote against what we're what we're going for. So I guess at this point I'm just so frustrated with having these meetings with them and then having them vote that way. Do you have any recommendation to try and keep them accountable without necessarily what, um, and, and and where are you from? Grundy County. Senator Resin and Rep Welter. And and uh, do you have others do you have you a community of people there who uh, are with you? I mean, when you go to these Absolutely. meetings, how many people go? Uh, a large community. They know we've, our nonprofit Special Connections has grown in eight years to serve thousands of people through our community. And it's just a, a volunteer run program. And we've now connected with Trinity Services to offer some more programs. So we have the people and you know they understand what we're working against but when it comes time to voting they vote with what maybe is the majority of, of what, their party um, what and, and how do they explain their votes to you um well they'll oftentimes they'll say well there was a part of it that the reason i couldn't vote for it was because of this segment but i support this part so they make it seem like it's too complicated for just a straight support vote mm -hmm. So. You know, I mean, I, th I'm now betraying my bias as someone who ran campaigns for 25 years, but it may be that we need to think about strategies to raise the public, you know, not make these conversations not just in the room, but also a larger conversation among Absolutely. the public. Because I think most people are too afraid to approach them and, and to hold them accountable for fear that they're not going to get the funding or support that they so desperately need. Yeah, no, I understand that. But, you know, it seems to me if a coalition of people who run small settings and, and, and larger settings uh, come together and, say, uh, and, and raise this as a civil rights issue and make it a public issue and maybe do, you know, even do advertising in markets and, and uh, events, public events, I mean, I think a full public relations strategy in some of these districts might make it a little bit easier. But uh, again, you know, we're climbing a hill, and that hill's been built up over a, a long period of time. But I think the tactics of activism have to be employed the other way, and uh, the the invocation of civil rights uh, needs to be turned the other way. And we just need to engage in that debate fully. Uh, so, um, you know, as long as it's an inside game, that gives the other side an advantage. And so, uh, you know, I, I would employ the, the tactics of activism uh, as, as they've been employed on the other side, within reason. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I thank you for being here, and I'm inspired to see all of you, and I look forward to seeing you again, again in a larger and larger group uh, in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, David.